Good morning, Fresno State family. Welcome to the Spring 2020 Faculty and Staff Assembly. I am Belinda Munoz, Chair of the Staff Assembly Executive Committee and the Co-Chair of the Alegria Mental Health Task Force. I am honored to be here with you this morning. Last spring, President Jimena Sandoval introduced the task force and shared that the word alegria, I'm sorry, shared the word alegria, which he then shared means joy, cheerful, and lively. Being part of these two committees has allowed me the opportunity to get to know many of you with hopes of bringing a little joy through various campus events. And joy is something we can all use a little little more of now more than ever. The year 2020 was anything but easy. The year 2021 was mostly working through the aftermath. The last couple of years didn't always bring joy or cheer or make me feel very lively. And if I'm being completely honest, some days were harder than others. In fact, this made me determined to try and see the joy in the days as I planned events. I think many of us could agree that 2021 brought so many blessings and heartaches. One of my cabinet's blessings was from 2021. I was serving ice cream in the middle of the summer heat. Serving the ice cream was definitely not the highlight. In fact, I was a hot mess. I, was, I remember how hot it was outside wearing my mask sweating with ice cream all over me. And if you know me, you know I was doing all of this in heels. It was terrible. Oh boy, did it bring tons of laughs, mostly at my expense, but seeing my colleagues laughing and enjoying the, the company was the best medicine I could have received on that very hot summer day. From time to time, receiving emails sharing how such a small token meant the world for the days that they were having, I felt joy. There was another moment that I am sure many of you remember on another hot summer afternoon, watching our president dancing in the middle of the speaker's platform. He was surrounded by students, staff, faculty, and community members, and enjoying an afternoon of laughter my first thought was, man, this guy has some talent. <laughs> he just showed so many of us up out there on that dance floor. It was also the moment I realized that he isn't afraid to try new things, dance a little outside the box, and do, this, do his best to bring joy and cheerfulness where he can. Now here we are, the year 2022. Standing here at a crossroad, deciding which direction I will go. I can head in one direction and be upset about the downfalls of my past couple of years and cry over things out of my control, or take the leap of faith and hope for the best of my days. Focus on positives and the things that bring me joy. It is my choice to take a small step and embrace happiness where I can find it. I stand here as a chair of the staff assembly and the co-chair of the Alervia task force and hope I can influence the same in all of you. I don't know how my days will start or end for that matter, but I do know I will get up, I will show up, and I will try every day. This semester, I encourage you to take a look at the year 22 and decide which direction you will strive for. My goal and commitment to each of you, both faculty and staff, is to work hard to bring a little more joy and sunshine to campus one event at a time. Our amazing team has, our amazing team has open positions if you are interested. I encourage you to go to our website for staff assembly and sign up to volunteer for an event and join our committee. I hope you will all join us in the semester at one of our events and give us a little opportunity to share a little bit of campus fun and joy with you. Allow us the opportunity to get to know you outside of the classroom or offices and unwind 
with others who relate to you in more ways than one. I look forward to seeing you this semester. Thank you. And now, please join me in welcoming the Chair of the Academic Senate, Professor Raymond Hall. Uh, thank you, Belinda. Uh, greetings, faculty, university administrators, and staff, and welcome back Fresno State students to the spring 2022 semester. Thank you, Belinda, for that introduction, and let me express my sincere appreciation for all the important hard work our excellent staff has done in getting us back into the classrooms in fall 2021. The faculty appreciate your indispensable efforts to our successful and safe fall 2021 repopulation. It was a big deal. Thank you. As you can see from the mask on my face, we have not yet entered a post-COVID world. However, we enter 2022 with a steadfast dedication to student learning and success and with determination to teaching our students in our classrooms on campus. We are unfortunately still not yet out of the woods on this pandemic. However, last semester showed us that science and infrastructure have indeed delivered us tools to seriously combat this virus and allowed us to serve our students with best practices. Despite the uncertainty of the pandemic, this campus community, students and faculty rose to the challenge and we delivered quality instruction through adherence to health and safety measures practiced by all to allow a majority of classes to meet face to face. And after more than a year of online teaching, I can personally say it was wonderful to be back in the classroom last fall. And I thank everyone, especially the students and ASI President Jackson for creating a culture that placed a priority on safety and community and in support of learning. Finally, a quick note and a PSA on some Senate business. To my faculty members, through some hard work, we have indeed established a quote, task force for exploring Fresno State operations in a post COVID world. And yeah, we're looking forward to that world when it gets here. But um, this is a representative task force with the charge of elucidating what we have learned from our forced online experiences of the past years and how to integrate new modes and methods into best academic policy policy that will best serve our students and policy that will probably question some long-standing assumptions concerning faculty norms and responsibilities. I wish to thank Professor Katie Dyer for agreeing to chair this important task force and I remind all faculty to make sure that you have your academic senators keep you updated on these important discussions. The task force will be seeking input from all of you this semester and we encourage your participation. Our guide to success will be through the diversity of Fresno State faculty expertise and experience. So be sure to let us know what you think. And that's all I have for you today. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our university president, Dr. Jimenez Sandoval. So good morning, Fresno State faculty and staff. I hope you had a restful holiday break and a chance to quietly reflect and take in the new year with those you love. During our assembly today, I'd like to focus on two uh, areas. The first is to share a vision of how Fresno State academics can work in tandem with athletics to bridge the university and the community, enhancing Fresno State's standing as a leading educational institution and advancing our mission of service. The second, is to lay the basic foundation for the process of our strategic plan. But before we get to those, let's take a moment to highlight a few members of the Fresno State community who are superb examples of the work being done at our university. Over the break, one of the things I reflected on was a recent survey through which our students reported feeling an overall sense of belonging, connectedness, and pride in being Bulldogs since returning to campus. This is without question due to the tireless work and selfless spirit of all of you. Thank you for your dedication to our students during these challenging times. As we begin 2022, returning briefly to virtual mode in an effort to keep everyone safe and healthy, I am honored to launch our spring semester with each of you and to navigate the transition back to campus together. Let me also thank our campus leaders for today's opening remarks and for their ongoing efforts in advancing our university. First, Professor Raymond Hall, thank you for your trusted leadership of the Academic Senate. Belinda Munoz, your dedicated and creative leadership of the staff assembly is greatly appreciated. Thank you for all you do. And to Georgiana Negron Long, 
Your steadfast leadership and clear communication as chair of the Joint Labor Council is so valued. I'd also like to thank ASI President DeAngelique Jackson for meeting the demands of student life and campus leadership as she wholeheartedly champions her fellow students. Thank you, President Jackson. And cabinet colleagues, I appreciate the extra attention you have given to addressing the safety of our campus during this tumultuous time. Provost Fu, Vice President Adishan A. Stone, Vice President Kuhn, and Director of Athletics, Terry Toomey, thank you for helping us to address so many complex issues with the best interest of our campus community in mind. Your efforts and continued check-ins with the COVID task force are making a difference. And thank you to the members of the task force for taking on this extra responsibility for much longer than any of us could have expected. I'm also grateful to my family, my wife, Dr. Mariana Agnostopoulos, and sons, Arion and Leo, for being so supportive during my uh, transition as president. A real special thanks to Mariana, who keeps us all together and organized at home. It is also important at this time of reflection to recognize, indeed, celebrate members of our gifted team of staff and faculty. So let's begin. And let's begin with Rick Chacon, Assistant Director of Admissions and Recruitment. For 23 years, Rick has helped thousands of students achieve their dreams of enrolling at Fresno State. During the pandemic, a time when enrollment dropped at many colleges and universities nationally, Rick led innovative efforts to reach prospective applicants virtually and to attract them to Fresno State. Huge thanks to Rick. Next, we have Robert Gwynn, who stepped up to fill the role of Interim Chief Information Officer. His understanding of the division and the initiatives at hand kept critical projects moving forward, including outdoor wireless service and the move to Adobe Sign. Both of these services are critical to virtual campus operations and our ability to meet the logistical challenges of this ongoing pandemic. Through his leadership, he exemplifies the clear tenets of a servant leader. Thank you, Robert, for your wise counsel and trustworthy leadership. <laughs> and it is also a pleasure to recognize Professor Mai Vang, who, based on the nomination submitted by her devoted students, received the Provost Award for Extraordinary Teaching in Extraordinary Times in Fall 2020. Her student mentorship led to the production of the first Hmong American Ink and Stories Literary Journal, which celebrates the lived experiences of our Hmong American community. This is a unique publication nationally and a beautiful piece of student artistry. Moreover, she published her acclaimed volume of poetry, Yellow Rain, an archaeology of memory, war, and the suffering brought upon by the chemical agent known as Yellow Rain. Fresno State is proud to have her teaching our diverse and talented students. Thank you, uh, Professor Wang. <laughs> now join me in recognizing Liz Garvin. In her role as Senior Director of Planned and Foundation Giving, Liz partners with deans and development team members across campus and in athletics. Her bright passion for Fresno State and for developing donor relationships shines through her every interaction and ultimately enables the university to launch initiatives that advance our campus mission. Liz is an expert in planned giving and she has introduced me to important donors. Over the past year, over the past year Liz has partnered with development colleagues to raise over seven million in support of student success at Fresno State. Thank you, Liz. Lastly, I would like to recognize the Department of Human Resources, including payroll and benefits. In addition to their regular functions, the HR team has worked tirelessly this past year to support COVID-related leave, and most recently, to provide guidance for over 80 staff and manager position recruitments. That's a lot. The team, led by AVP Mary Lou Mendoza Miller, has continually adjusted its workload to meet the ever-changing impacts of the pandemic and has worked collaboratively with many different areas across campus with kindness, 
respect, and compassion. They truly model the principles of community. Thank you very much. Thank you again to everyone whose combined efforts ensures that our students continue to thrive. Now, let's look toward our future. In my first year as president of this multifaceted university, I realized how essential building a strong and unified team is to our future success. I see strong teams at every level, whether it be department, within a division, school, or college, and across campus. Indeed, two primary teams come together in promoting excellence at Fresno State, academics and athletics. On the academic side, the College of Health and Human Services is a prime example of how we impact every facet of Valley life. Fresno State teams of nursing students and faculty have traversed the San Joaquin Valley since the early days of the pandemic, administering about 8,700 vaccinations to the most vulnerable communities, including those in rural areas and farm workers who might otherwise not have convenient access to healthcare. Under the supervision of Dr. Kathleen Drindle, our students have visited numerous towns surrounding Fresno, providing health screenings for blood pressure, diabetes, and more. This mobile health unit intricately ties Fresno State to the very people who form the fabric of the community, all while providing valuable learning experiences for our students who are soon to graduate and help alleviate our region's shortage of healthcare providers. Another source of pride that I want to share with you is the consolidation of Fresno State's water research, education, and external efforts under a single, restructured California Water Institute, or CWI. Fresno State has been a leader in water research and community engagement for several decades. The Consolidated Institute will build upon this legacy by engaging faculty, students, staff, and researchers from disciplines across the university to address some of the most challenging water issues of our time. In addition to agriculture, engineering, technology, science, economic, and policy research and education, the California Water Institute will focus on sustainable water resource management solutions through outreach and entrepreneurship. This collaborative entity brings together multiple disciplines and I'm thankful for Dean Dennis Neff and Dean Ram Nuna's combined efforts on this project. I'm also happy to announce that Dr. Charles Hillier will serve as interim associate vice president for the Institute. These are two prime examples of how our academic fields have a direct and positive impact on our valley. They also show that Fresno State remains on the forefront of cutting edge knowledge production. The second division I'd like to highlight today is athletics. And this academic year is special. The 2021-22 season is our centennial year of celebration for Fresno State athletics. For 100 years, 100 years, our student athletes, our Bulldogs, have been the region's team. These student athletes are true students in every sense of the word. Like so many of our students who hold down jobs while going to college, our student athletes are earning a college degree while they represent the university in the sport they love. At Fresno State, thanks to our committed coaches, educational support staff, and administrators, our student athletes' cumulative GPA is consistently higher than the overall student body GPA. Round of applause for Director of Athletics, Terry Toomey, and our many successful coaches. Thank you. You may have recently read the article 100 Years of Cheers in Fresno State Magazine, the university's biannual publication for alumni and friends. Our magazine featured a fascinating timeline of 100 moments and milestones that have helped shape Fresno State athletics over the past century. Amazing feats that represent us all in a history and tradition we can take pride in. This season, this, this season that's my Spanish coming through, right? <laughs> this, 
these season, these season, <laughs> there he goes, <laughs> our football team won 10 games for the third time in five years. That feat has only been accomplished once before in our school's history. With that success, we were ecstatic to rehire Bulldog alumnus Jeff Tedford, who is back leading this program that is near and dear to his heart. As I speak about our athletic history today, I come from a place of inspiration. Coming from academia as a lifelong educator, I did not expect to be so moved by our athletic endeavors. Growing up on the farm, I would spend my free time reading, not playing. Yes, I was a bookworm. <laughs> Hence, when our football team went down to the Rose Bowl and beat number 13 UCLA in breathtaking fashion this past September, I was ecstatic at how our Bulldogs on the field represented Fresno State and our region. With moments following that game, and for days after, our quarterback, Jake Hayner, became a household name, and Fresno State was, once again, national news. Online traffic boomed as the event drove social media impressions into the millions. It brought much deserved attention to our campus, and in that shining moment, allowed our valley to beam with pride under the national spotlight. There is perhaps no other event in the Valley that has the power to attract over 40,000 people together in one place, regardless of race, religion, income, or political affiliation, and unite a community around a common cause like Fresno State Athletics can. And time and time again, we hear from alumni, students, and families that their initial contact with the university is through athletics. When a family attends a Fresno State game and a child puts on that bulldog red shirt for the first time, that child gets a taste of belonging to our campus community. They take that first stroll across campus and suddenly, being a Fresno State student becomes an attainable goal. For so many, athletics is that entry point, the front porch of the university. Hence. Fresno State Academics and Athletics is a winning combination. It is a partnership that is 100 years strong and that can spur growth for the next century. That is why I am forming the President's Commission on the Future of Athletics to chart the next stages of development to further strengthen our unified efforts. This commission will explore a sustainable funding model for Bulldog Athletics, one that promotes growth recognizes that our athletics program enriches Fresno State academics and our region, and supports our student athletes in both their educational and athletic pursuits. Indeed, the stronger our athletics program is, the greater opportunities to grow partnerships that will promote scholastic achievement will be. Another example of a team effort to promote achievement in our diverse valley includes the work of academic affairs and student affairs, of which I spoke last time with you. Our university recently became one of just 24 nationwide to earn the prestigious seal of excellencia for its efforts to close education equity gaps and increase the number of Latinx students attaining a college degree. I do want to emphasize that Fresno State's initiatives acknowledged by Excelencia are a part of larger concentrated efforts, or larger concentrated efforts, to ensure that our university remains accessible and welcoming to students of all backgrounds, especially those who are historically underserved. The strategies fueling our graduation initiative 2025 results are to be credited for removing barriers to college retention and attainment. Many of our successes thus far are outcomes of our previous strategic plan. To continue moving our goals ahead, we are doing the following. Hiring diverse tenure track faculty in critical need areas who are committed to eliminating equity gaps. Hiring 10 new advisors in academic affairs which will reduce the student to advisor ratio from 660 to one 
to 500 to 1, a vast improvement at nearly 25% load reduction. Provost Fu is leading efforts that are reducing D, F, and W courses where there are significant achievement gaps among underrepresented minority students. We are increasing course access, which has proven to be a significant barrier to retention and completion for our student body. We're enhancing outreach and course registration efforts to improve first semester and first year retention. And Vice President Kuhn is continuing to support basic needs initiatives by enhancing resources and investments in student well-being. The deep collaboration I've seen between academic affairs, the side of the house that inspires our students with its teaching and research, and student affairs, the side of the house that promotes student well-being through programs, activities, and resources in mental health, tutoring, advising, and basic needs, will secure the success of our graduation initiative 2025. To date, we have made significant progress toward our goal of, a, of graduating 35% of freshmen in four years. In 2020-2021, we were at 24.7%, an increase of more than 9% since we set this goal in 2016-17. We have also made strides toward our four-year transfer graduation goal of 80%. In 2020, 2021, 75.4% of our transfer students graduated in four years, an improvement of almost 5% since 2016-17. To ensure that our 2025 goals result in positive, personal, and regional impact, we will work to strengthen the connection between education, industry, and community to prepare our graduates to become productive community members and lead the workforce of tomorrow. To that end, I'm hosting a listening tour to gather input from campus members and industry leaders. I will share the feedback uh, gathered at my investiture and also integrated into our strategic planning framework and our vision for the upcoming years. So what then will be the focus of our new strategic plan? Let's build on the relationship between academics, athletics, industry, community, philanthropy, our student affairs for the benefit of future graduates. The 2022-27 strategic plan process is underway with support from the Strategic Planning RFP Committee. The timeline expects campus and community forums to begin in March. I look forward to your active participation and hearing your thoughts and ideas during this time of academic and technological change and innovation. Planning for our collective future presents an exciting time for Fresno State. I presented to you how athletics elevates our brand and increases community engagement. How a unified team of academics and athletics is a winning combination for our future. And how solid results of GI 2025 are the product of the unified team efforts of academic affairs and student affairs. It's clear that this pandemic has challenged us in ways unimaginable, yet, it is crystal clear that the team of the greater Bulldog family is our strongest asset during these trying times. I would like to once again thank you for your continued efforts, goodwill and flexibility in keeping focused on our mission to empower every student for future success. I'm fully aware that our community is under the strain of COVID fatigue. It seems like with every attempt to normalize, the pandemic throws us another curveball. However, we are a community of problem solvers, one that comes together and rises to the occasion, and that's our secret. No matter what comes our way, our combined efforts allow us to navigate our ship to calmer waters. I want to also thank you for starting the semester virtually, for reaching out to our students with the passion that characterizes you as an invested instructor, office staff member, 
advisor, tutor, coach, healthcare professional. Please know that your efforts to connect on a personal level with our students are deeply appreciated. We are here for the success of our students, a majority of whom are first generation. In all of our students though, a deep personal transformation happens in their college years, one that establishes new generations of college graduates that directly impacts the daily lives of families in our valley. And more university degrees translate to a stronger economy and a better quality of life for us all. That is Fresno State's impact on this valley, and that is the proof of what a unified team can do. Thank you. I welcome your thoughts and the opportunity to answer your questions. Professor Betsy Hayes will moderate uh, today. Professor Betsy Hayes, please. Thank you. Thank you, President Jimenez Sandoval, and hello, Fresno State colleagues. I'm Professor Betsy Hayes, Chair of the Department of Media, Communications, and Journalism, and I'll be assisting as moderator for the Q&A session of our 2022 Spring Assembly this morning. As you know, Dr. Jimenez Sandoval, joined by other colleagues, are, is happy to answer your questions. Before you, we start, um, I want to go over a couple of guidelines. For this portion of the gathering, if you would like to ask a question, please include your question in the Q&A area. In order to keep things moving along, I'm not going to be able to monitor the chat as well. However, as you have been throughout the morning, please use the chat. It's been lovely to fill the love via Zoom from all of you for our fabulous colleagues. Assisting President Jimenez Sandoval here today with the Q&A, our Interim Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Zhuaning Fu, and Vice President for Administration and Chief Financial Officer, Debbie A. Stone. So we're gonna get started. And I get to ask the first question. <laughs> so, President Jimenez Sandoval, what are your thoughts about the likelihood that the January 31st return to campus date will hold? And if it is going to be pushed back, when would we know? Thank you, uh, Professor Hayes, for that question. And <clears throat> that is the question of the day, the question of the hour, right? The pandemic has taught us that we can plan ahead, we can establish dates, uh, and then at the end, what do we do? We continuously have to reassess the situation as we go along. Uh, with that being said, we are right now on track to open face-to-face -face instruction. We are opening virtually first, but then going to face-to-face -face instruction on the 31st of January. Uh, Vice President Aistone and Provost Fu We'll meet with the county health officials, which are uh, Dave Lucchini, who is the director, um, and then Dr. Swifler, who is also their main chief advisor uh, this Friday. And then based on that, we reassess and then we keep going. As of now, though, January 31st seems to be the date in which we return to campus for face-to-face. -face. I'd like to say two things uh, regarding that. Number one, we believe in science, like Professor uh, Hall said before. And science tells us that when we use masks, appropriate masks in this case, we can reduce the spread of COVID. We can reduce the spread of Omicron. So one is the fact that we have a very strong protocol of how to keep our people safe at Fresno State. With masks, with the hygiene uh, processes that we've established, um, as well as with everything else that comes together uh, within that, which is the cleaning protocols and everything we've had to do uh, over the past uh, uh, years. That's one part. The other part, though, is that we as a community, we take care of each other. And that means what? It means that on campus, we have seen a very strong adoption of the mask wearing uh, culture. Uh, whenever I go out into the quad or whenever I'm around uh, walking uh, in, in, in the university, even outside students are wearing masks uh, uh, for the most part. And that means that our processes and our protocols are established well-intentioned and well-proven uh, well to keep the COVID at bay. Uh, with this, I believe that what we have in place at Fresno State will keep us safe uh, we have postponed the face-to-face uh, -face, 
uh, instruction until the 31st because that will buy us time in order for the surge of the Omicron to then begin to begin to decline. So, so far, we are on track. If we get new information, of course, we always will readapt to the existing situation that is most pertinent at hand. Thank you. Thank you. And just a, another note to our wonderful Fresno State colleagues out there in Zoom land. Um, I may be paraphrasing um, a couple of questions and or combining them. However, please do know that um, President Jimenez Sandoval, as well as the cabinet, will get the exact text of all questions that are asked this morning. So I did want to make that clarification. So. Um, Speaking of January 31st, another question related to that. Um, are telecommuting options being considered after January 31st? And this colleague um, went on to say that part-time options with staggering schedules might be a good idea to consider to allow staff to be in their offices, you know, and um, ensure services to students are not affected, but still offer that telecommuting option. So I guess that's the first question. Right. So, so that question then essentially says up, up until the 31st of January, uh, we have encouraged our managers uh, to provide the staff the flexibility to work from home uh, because we are, we are open. Uh, but we want to encourage that. There are some positions, though, that have to be here because they are, they are face, uh, front, f uh, uh, face forward uh, to the community, to the student body uh, primarily. Um, so that's one part of it. But the other part, after the 31st of January, I have given the vice presidents the authority to determine uh, what schedules will work best for their own divisions, in what positions, will be the best for, for, for these schedules as well. Um, so the vice presidents right now are, are charged with that, um, and each one of them knows their division uh, best. Uh, right now, each vice president then will determine uh, what positions uh, and then uh, uh, how they will implement uh, this, this, this telecommute work uh, within their own divisions as well. Thank you. And there's a follow-up related question. I'll just kind of summarize it as a comment there. Um, you addressed how those decisions are going to be made, and this was just an encouragement for fairness and equity, you know, obviously um, to, you know, maintain morale. So just wanted to make that note from our colleague. So according to the New York Times, the seven-day average new COVID cases are 2,315 cases in Fresno County due to the Omicron variant. I have a child under the age of five and who is not eligible to be vaccinated. Can you give faculty who have a child under the age of five the option to continue virtual teaching after January 28th? And that I'm going to defer to the provost who has been working very strongly with the deans um, in addressing all of these type of questions. Provost. Uh, can you say the question again? I'm Absol sorry. Absolutely. Um, this, is a, a, um, this is a reference to the number of COVID cases in Fresno County. And then the question is, are, is the university able to give faculty with children under the age of five who are not eligible for vaccination, give those faculty the opportunity to continue to teach virtually after January 28th? Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I am currently in consultation with the uh, faculty affairs and the faculty senate leadership to work out uh, um, operational procedures, how we accommodate um, fac individual faculty needs when those situations arise. And I anticipate the guidelines will be ready towards the end of this week or early next week. Thank you. Next question is, administration explains how much students want to be back on campus However, this colleague's experiences with students say otherwise, especially as we've had to close several in-person classes for low enrollment. How are all students, staff, and faculty voices being heard? We have a structure at the university that, that actually works really well, and it's the structure that is primarily based on democracy. Um, and this structure goes back to the department. The department is the basic unit of the academic world within the university. That department coexists with other departments, and then these departments then form a college or a school. Uh, within this college or a school, then you have the dean, and then the dean, in turn, 
uh, coexist and interact with other deans who in turn then report to the provost, who in turn reports to the president. So within this structure that we have, which works quite well, uh, the voice of all should be heard within the department. That voice then should be heard by the dean within the collective uh, uh, meeting of the other departments as well. And then collectively, that dean uh, is responsible for representing these voices to the provost moving forward. Uh, within all of this then, the charge of the dean then is to manage enrollment. The charge of the dean is to say, I see a department with low enroll classes here, but very high demand over here. Why don't we you know, restructure the low enroll classes and then create more where there is more of a demand, if that is possible, of course. So within this structure, each faculty, each instructor has the responsibility to make that voice known to the chair, who in turn then is responsible for reporting to the dean. The dean is then responsible for reporting to the provost if it, if it goes to that level, of course. Within each of the colleges though, each of the deans is charged, according to the provost and my conversations with him, in doing what? In, management, in managing this enrollment and in providing then the opportunity for our students to, uh, to get the best, of the, the best experience for enrolling at Fresno State. Uh, there are going to be certain disciplines that I'm sure will have a strong demand for online, while other disciplines will have a very strong demand for in-person. There will be some disciplines that will have a strong demand for virtual instruction. However, it's not always optimal to have these classes be virtually taught, as we have seen from, from, uh, from, from the past and from the grades that the students receive uh, in virtual versus in-person instruction. So within all of this taking into consideration, we have to make the best decision moving forward for the benefit of the students. And that benefit of the students implies that we need to provide them with an ecosystem that allows them to learn at their optimal. And within that framework, there will be some classes that will be taught in person because they will learn better in person, just based on past processes and based on past records of the grades that we've received in the past, uh, virtual versus in person. So with that, I hope I've answered the question. If not, reach out to me personally. You know my email, sjimenez at csufresno.edu. Thank you. Thank you. Um, after we move from virtual back to face-to-face, -to -face, is the expectation that courses will still be available virtually for students who may test positive later in the semester and are unable to attend classes? And I'll defer to the provost because I know that he's been managing uh, this situation for some time. I am assuming that the situation will be handled as we have handled it this past semester. I don't know if that will uh, will change protocols in this new semester coming up. Provost. Thank you for the question. Uh, we have a system in place as we implemented in fall 2021 how we handle students who are unable to come to class. Um, if these students happen to take a hybrid class or virtual class, this will not be a concern. Students in face-to-face -face classes who have to be absent um, would already know we have a relaxed uh, class attendance policy and the faculty will be required to provide uh, reasonable accommodations and extended due days uh, such as these accommodations to help these students to complete their studies in the said classes. If there is any situation that is not provided accommodation in the current policy relaxation, the faculty and the students can always discuss with uh, the chair or the dean or my office and we will do our best to accommodate and to ensure our students would have opportunity to be successful in their classes. Thank you. How is the weekly COVID testing verified for non-vaccinated coworkers? As a vaccinated employee, I'd like to be confident that my non-vaccinated coworkers are faithfully adhering to this requirement. 
Yeah, and thank you for that question. I'll defer to uh, Vice President Astone uh, for the answer on this one. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, compliance of our uh, weekly mandatory testing for our employees who have attested to either a medical or religious exemption. Um, we continue to communicate with those employees. Uh, we continue to send those reminders through either HR or faculty affairs. But I would just encourage everyone that this is an individual responsibility. Um, if you have chosen not to be vaccinated and have attested appropriately on your self-certification form, it is each individual responsibility, whether it's a student, faculty, or staff, to comply with the mandatory weekly testing requirement. I wanna say thank you to many who have complied. Uh, this has been an ongoing effort and collaboration between academic affairs, student affairs, and administration and finance to provide the resources that are easily accessible for our campus community at no cost. The convenience of having the testing um, now over at the Student Recreation Center, it has moved from the Satellite Student Union. Um, the services that we're uh, getting there from our uh, third party vendor uh, the turnaround time on the tests are uh, so much better than you would if you went down to Walgreens or Rite Aid. Uh, we're providing the masks, as President Jimenez Sandoval mentioned, and of course, uh, our vaccination and booster clinics. As a reminder, uh, the booster is required per the CSU interim vaccination policy for all non-represented uh, employees and students by February 28th. We will continue, uh, and thanks to the partnership with UCSF, uh, in providing those uh, vaccination and booster clinics. And it will be an ongoing um, effort of compliance with the mandatory weekly testing. But just even last week, we had 1,500 individuals test at the Student Rec Center, many of whom are not back on campus yet. And I think that says a lot about the care and the convenience of having the testing center here on campus open to our students and faculty and staff at no cost so that they can continue to be safe and keep their families safe. And again, I would just encourage and remind everyone that it is our individual responsibility to help keep each other safe, as well as our families and our campus community. Thank you. <clears throat> Will the Provost Graduation Initiative Grant continue this summer? The website has not been updated, and obviously we hope the answer is yes. <laughs> I do too, Provost. <laughs> GI 2025 has been one of our um, most important missions and goals for the university and for the system. Uh, our latest uh, statistics and progress indicate we have been making progresses and we also experience uh, challenges. So we are doing really well in half of the six goals and we have work to do in the rest of the goals. The most a significant challenge for the whole system, Fresno State is part of it, is um, <clears throat> student retention. Due to the COVID challenges, the whole nation and the CSU system and Fresno State have suffered with the enrollment drops. So <clears throat> this year, with the help of uh, GI 2025 funding, and we are working really diligently and creatively to bring our students back to our campus, to our classes. And the early statistics, not the final statistics, indicate that um, between fall and the spring of this year, and we are looking at a higher retention rate than we had at the same time last year. We are also providing extended class access to students, maintaining small classes that we normally would not maintain if these classes are important for student retention, graduation, and progress to degree. And the system, um, under the leadership of the Chancellor's Office and with the support of the state government, and have issued significant uh, <coughs> GI 2025 financial help and we are working on five priorities this semester and continue the effort with the increase of tenure <laughs> um, density among our faculty and other related student success projects. Thank you. 
Um, there's a request for an update on the provost search, as well as the vice president of student affairs and enrollment. That's a, that's a great question. So right now I'm waiting for the academic senate to send me the names of their uh, committee members for these two very important committees. Once I have those names, then I will put my names, uh, the, the people selected from, from my, uh, from my uh, position on that committee, and then we will move forward with that uh, expeditiously during this semester. So it's, it's, on, it's on its way. Uh, as you know, the Senate has been on break. Now they're back, and I'm sure that they will send me those names um, pretty, pretty shortly. And another and Dr. timeline. Dr. Question. Hall says thumbs up. <laughs> thumbs up on that. Excellent. We're getting <laughs> thumbs up from Dr. Hall. I love it. Um, live updates, folks. Right. So, um, speaking of timelines, um, folks are obviously very excited about the 10 new academic advisors that you mentioned in your talk. Do we have a timeline for the hiring of those advisors? Uh, we do. It should be uh, pretty sh shortly it's this semester. Um, so, within this semester, we will have we will have those academic advisors on board as well. So it should be within the next, the next few weeks coming up. So you talked about um, the, after the January 31st, um, temporary telecommuting discussions that are happening for, for staff. Um, this colleague wants to know if there is um, a plan for a more than temporary conversation about telecommuting. We have right now a draft policy. Uh, it is a policy that is an interim policy. We will adapt it and then we will see how it goes and then go from there. Uh, we do not have something permanent right now because these are not the times to have permanent policies. But we are certainly moving forward with a draft policy at this time that will then be implemented and then move from there to see how things go. So yeah, that's, that's, that's the, the best answer that I can give you right now. Um, sure, of course. Um, in addition, uh, just want to also add to the president's comments uh, that uh, we are following uh, the MOU's uh, and, pol and system-wide policy for telecommute work uh, and we'll be communicating um, are adopting into those uh, in the next, uh, shortly in the next week or so. But as the president mentioned, we are looking at implementing a pilot program that we will um, communicate uh, within the next week to our campus community. Again, very, uh, that expresses what the president's uh, sharing this morning. Again, we recognize that this is something that um, may be very suitable for certain um, positions and recognize uh, that that staggered kind of work schedule um, maybe something that uh, we should, you know, look at and, and support, but we also recognize that we are an on-campus uh, community and we need to be able to operationally provide uh, the face-to-face -face interaction uh, for our students and faculty and staff that are needed in many of our operational areas, while at the same time recognizing uh, that telework um, is something that um, has become part of our kind of work culture. So there will be more communication coming out on that but again, it is subject to operational feasibility and equity that was mentioned earlier amongst uh, the various kind of departments and um, administrative areas. So there will be some additional communication coming out uh, for more of those details. This colleague is wondering, can you provide an update regarding ECRL and with Omicron, will be, it be extended to 2022? E C R L. And I'm I sorry. apologize, I did not do it. It was only through December 31st, um, 2021, and we are not aware that that will be extended um, unless we receive further communication uh, from the Chancellor's Office. Excellent. With so many people calling out, well, there's a couple of, I guess, sort of protocol y questions regarding our, the university's COVID response and things like with so many people calling out sick, is it possible to ask them to get tested before returning from the office? Um, concerns about the, how EHS allowing individuals who have been exposed to COVID but are not symptomatic and are fully vaccinated um, be on campus. Um, so I don't know, Debbie, if you just kind of want to talk in general about our COVID protocols. 
Sure, I'll be able to provide some general, um, and thank you for the question, general uh, response, but also I would encourage everyone uh, to go to our COVID website. Uh, our team, collective teams um, between academic affairs, student affairs, uh, and eh and uh, have we have worked together to update the FAQs. We are following uh, the most recent uh, guidelines for isolation and quarantine from the California Department of Public Health. And so there are some uh, variances there, uh, but please look at the FAQs um, because uh, depending upon certain situations, uh, someone can uh, test negative um, after day five with a rapid antigen test and be able to re return to work. Uh, we are encouraging everyone uh, to get tested before returning back to campus. Uh, and again, we have those resources at the Student Rec Center, but we are following the California Department of Public Health for the isolation and quarantine requirements and the ability to return to work with a negative rapid antigen test after day five. Please contact EHNS if you have specific questions, but also go to our website with the FAQs. We've taken a lot of care to try to put a lot of detail and responses as part of those FAQs to be helpful for our campus community. And also our COVID call center was reestablished last Monday. So you can also utilize that resources as well for any questions. And of course, please feel free to reach out if there's anything specific, I'd be glad to try to help um, answer those questions. And just to confirm, folks can get to everything via the gold bar on the website, correct? Yes, correct. And I think your suggestion of having folks go in and see what's new and um, remind themselves <laughs> about everything is an excellent um, suggestion for right now as we get ready to start the semester. So we try to I, update those for the relevancy. So there's been some good improvements. Yeah, absolutely. So please, Betsy, please let, let me let that. me add something to that. Yes. Uh, and let me really focus on testing uh, for just a minute. Uh, one of my family members reached out to me on Saturday and said, uh, do you know where I can get a, get a, get a test, a PCR test? Um, because I went online and the earliest test that I can get is on Tuesday, but then that, those results for that test uh, get here in five days. Uh, the maximum amount of time is five days, right? Um, and I started to think about that and I said, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry, we, uh, doesn't, doesn't your, your, your work place provide this and then uh, he said to me they do provide me with the ability to test but only on Thursdays um, and then when we do get tested at work uh, after that we get the results back on Tuesdays so then there's a pretty significant amount of time lag there in getting the results what we are doing here at Fresno State it's really phenomenal it is not just the gold but the platinum standard for testing uh, within the region and within any organization that you go um, uh, uh, within the region, you will you will find that Fresno State is is right up there. Um, perhaps, probably the hospitals you know might meet us in the efficiency or the, the the timeliness of this. But when you get tested at Fresno State, and I get tested every week, just because I want to make sure that the family is safe and everyone around me is safe, because I come to work every day. So. When you get tested at Fresno State, I go in the morning, usually around 8.30, 9 o'clock. I do this little spit you know, into the little vial. I seal it really well. I give it to them. Everything is clean and everything else. Very uh, spaced out within, uh, within the rec center. Very professional. Click, click, and then that's it. It takes less than five minutes for me to do that. And then that same day, without a glitch, that same day, by around 7.30, 8 o'clock, 8.30 p.m., I get the results back. That is a service to you that costs around $300 outside of the university, but to you, it's free, and to you, it's fast, and it's efficient, and it's of the highest quality. So I really want to focus on that. I want to encourage you to use the service that we have provided for you for all of the campus community. Uh, everyone on campus, students, faculty, and staff can get tested once a week at the rec center for free. And this is the PCR test. This is not the rapid antigen test. The PCR test is the most accurate test we have available to us right now. So I really want to uh, uh, really want to focus on that and provide this free service. It's a service. It's not it's not top down. You know, saying you have to get tested. It's what you do for yourself and for your family and for your community as well. 
Thank you. Can you please provide a bud, excuse me, provide a budget, provide an update <laughs> on the 22-23 budget? Will all employees be getting raises, especially with inflation? This is an imperative. Yeah, that's that's a great question. As you know, the CFA uh, just went through negotiations with the CSU. Those, neg no, those negotiations uh, did imply a conclusion that the faculty will get races uh, in the coming uh, in the coming uh, year. Uh, some are retroactive as well, and then of course CSUEU is in the process of negotiating, uh, and they will most likely begin these negotiations within the spring. I, I'm I have a feeling that those negotiations will move forward uh, in ways that will also raise the salaries of our faculty uh, of our staff as well. Um, and then, of course, there's another layer to all of this in that the CSU and the legislature came together to do a study of salaries across the 23 campus system. And then this study of salaries for the staff specifically will come out um, in March, I believe, uh, from what I heard uh, at the chancellor's meeting. Uh, and then once we have you know, guidance on that, I think we will have a pretty strong North Star of where these negotiations and where the salaries will land in the future as well. So I'm confident that this will be the case. Uh, I, as your president, uh, am your, your biggest advocate and your biggest champion for fair wages and for fair, for fair, uh, uh, for fair representation as well. So, so within that, you can count on me to, uh, to be the voice that speaks the reality that you are undergoing at this moment uh, in this COVID pandemic. Thank you. Um, new student union updates, and is there a date when it will be opening? <laughs> there is an update, and I just saw some of the uh, some of the decorations, you know, the other day uh, by email, and I al actually toured uh, part of the student union uh, about uh, a month and a half ago. But I'm going to turn to uh, Vice President Astone, who will give you the full update of where we are with that. But we are well on track mm -hmm. to seeing the new student union, the Resnick Student Union open in the fall. Thank you, President, and thank you for the question. Uh, we're very excited. Uh, the, the building is really taking shape and now really kind of a lot of uh, final interior finishes, um, equipment, furnishings have been ordered. I just wanna say thank you to our student leadership, our leadership and in student involvement, our team in facilities and, and everyone uh, in advancement and others who have been so helpful as part of the overall uh, design and construction and completion of this very important project for our students. Uh, the project is on schedule to open in the fall. Uh, you know, some of this will be contingent upon final fire marshal approvals and occupancies and, and things that we need to go through with any project. Uh, but the building is beautiful. Our students are just going to be just elated and so excited to see uh, the new building and what it will offer for our students with spaces, programs, uh, new food concepts. It's, uh, it's a beautiful building and we're so excited to be able to open that in the fall and look forward to more information about ribbon cutting and other celebratory events. And again, just again, wanna thank uh, the Resnicks for their support uh, financially uh, with their very generous gift and the naming and all of our donors who have been um, so supportive of the project in addition to what our students supported with their fee. So uh, more to come and now we're working on the landscape design and some possible uh, other monuments that'll be part of the project. So look forward to more updates, uh, but we're on track for the fall. Oh, that's lovely news. <clears throat> this colleague asked this question. Since we have been, excuse me, since we have sworn to defend the U.S. and state constitutions, what are we doing to support students' rights to refuse face coverings and COVID tests? So the the question is, <laughs> it you know it's it's uh, it's it's been at, at the eye of of all of this situation, um, the U.S. Constitution and the California Constitution as well, are based on Enlightenment ideals that speak about community, but that speak specifically about the individual's responsibility to the group. It is my individual responsibility for myself, first of all, but second of all, primarily, I am responsible for the betterment of my society. I am responsible to apply my gifts as a sentient, as a thinking being, 
to the betterment of who we are as a community. Within this framework, there is such a thing as looking out for each other, and there is such a thing as who we are at Fresno State and as a community. The regulations that we have at Fresno State about mask wearing and about the vaccines, they're not just simply whims. They're not just simply things that some, someone came up and said, I think I'll you know, impose masks and I think I'll provide the vaccine mandate. These are based on science and science does work. If you wear a mask, it is proven that you will reduce the risk to others if you are COVID positive, or if you have a cold, or if you have the flu, or whatever else it might be. So these are not based on the intention to limit an individual's liberty. They're not meant to curve tail someone's notion of identity. They're meant to create and harbor a sense of community and care for each other. So the fact that we wear masks at Fresno State and the fact that we vaccinate at Fresno State does not mean that I'm giving up my own personal freedoms. It means that I have a love for others that transcends my own and that cares for others. And within this love for others, it's the notion of family, the Bulldog family that sticks together. It is the notion that I will take care of you and you in turn will create a community with me and take care of me as well. So it's building together. I don't think this has to do with individual freedoms. It has to do with what type of a community, what type of a society we want. And I say this in the context of having gone through Martin Luther King Jr. holiday just yesterday, uh, the day before yesterday. So within that, I would like us to refocus and reposition ourselves into how it is that we wear masks because we care. We wear masks because we promote each other. We wear masks because we apply our own personal talents to building a better community at Fresno State and within the greater Fresno region. Beautifully said, thank you. A lot of, um, and it's not just me saying that, there's a lot in the chat too. <laughs> Thanks. A <clears throat> um, Couple of just real specific detail things, Debbie, real quick. Um, N95s, um, are the university still um, providing those for folks who, who request them? And is the link in the... Yes, the online form is still available. We also have a supply of KN95 masks that don't require a specific online form. My apologies. I was looking at... Oh, Press my apologies too. <laughs> <laughs> I never get to see her, so it's nice to see her. Uh, and so those can be requisitioned by campus departments through our warehouse. And we also have them available um, at various locations on campus, the Student Health and Counseling Center, the atrium at Student Housing, um, at the Testing Center, um, at the Student Recreation Center, but departments can requisition the KN95s and the surgical masks. The surgical masks, uh, we are very effective as well, and we have a lot of supply of those. And we have ordered more N95s, but those do require the online um, individual request form, which is still in place. And that is because many ask me, well, why is that? It's because Cal OSHA requires that if an employee uses an N95 on a voluntary basis, that we need to have confirmation that they've been trained on how to utilize and wear the mask. And that is a Cal OSHA requirement, not because we're trying to be difficult or not trying to you know, make it easy for those masks to be distributed. So uh, we have plenty of supply at the warehouse. I wanna thank our team, Brian Cotham, Mike Von Dolan, and Tiffany Burmeister on all of their help in getting the supplies to our campus departments and making those available and keeping our inventory in strong supplies that we can meet our needs. So thank you. And if you have questions, please reach out. And that information is also available on the COVID website FAQs. Does the delayed return to face-to-face -face learning only affect on-campus courses or does it also impact classes <clears throat> excuse me, being held off campus or internships? Uh, Provost Fu, I'll, I'll, refer that, I'll defer that to you. So uh, off campus or internships, are they impacted by the face-to-face -face no. virtual? No, off campus internships are not affected. Uh, these off campus internship activities have been uh, <clears throat> implemented last fall mostly per the internship side, COVID 
safety health regulations. Most importantly, um, we have two major areas of those off-campus internship uh, courses. One is in the health service area, the other is uh, teaching practice area. Both of these areas of off-campus internship activities are continued as they've been planned. My apologies. A lot of things that are a little bit similar. Um, we're getting a couple of um, several questions regarding eating and drinking at your desk guidelines, and also what if offices don't allow for for the social distancing? So uh, maybe a few Vice President Aston, I'll sure. to you. Um, if there are um, situations within your individual offices where um, the six feet of distancing cannot be maintained. Um, please reach out to Amy Luna, our manager of emergency preparedness. She will come over and evaluate the workstations and help make some recommendations or strategies. Uh, but yes, uh, if you are eating or drinking, you can remove your mask. But again, you want to maintain that six foot, at least minimum distancing from um, another individual while you're eating or drinking and then be, you know, put your mask right back on. Uh, we are also um, kind of encouraging if there are areas that have smaller break rooms, please try to limit the capacity of, of folks that might be in those break rooms at any one time, maybe try to have some staggered schedules. Also, the weather's getting a little bit better, so we have you know, beautiful outdoor areas and seating areas to take advantage of um, in the nicer weather. So uh, hopefully those, those opportunities will, um, will, will, will be helpful. But again, please reach out to Amy Luna if there's any kind of specific questions about kind of office uh, our desk location and distancing requirements. Thank you. Um, we talked a little bit about budget and, and um, the union's efforts to, to hopefully get staff some additional increases too, but this is a question about any updates on, on staff non-union COLA increase. And I'll defer to Vice President Aston as, as well for that one. Um, not to our knowledge, uh, this, that again would be something that would be bargained at a system-wide level. And as the president mentioned, uh, bargaining is uh, beginning uh, with many of our staff unions uh, this spring. So any type of um, either um, equity increase or uh, what results may come from the uh, survey that is being done by uh, an outside consultant, all of that will be taken into consideration as part of the system-wide bargaining, uh, but understand uh, the need and understand, um, when, as the president mentioned, uh, the need to support our staff and our faculty in this regard, and we look forward um, to learning more as, as bargaining begins. Uh, so that, that would be linked to any of those discussions. So we've talked about the several upcoming searches that everyone is very excited about. Um, this is a request for an update for the director of the cross-cultural and gender center that is said to be maybe transitioning into the chief diversity officer, maybe some clarification and info on that. Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. Um, and I was waiting for that one. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we just had a conversation uh, between uh, Vice President Kuhn, uh, Vice President A. Stone, uh, Mary Lou Mendoza Miller, uh, Diana Rawls and, and me. And within that conversation at the end, we decided that uh, it was best to have a director of the Cross-Cultural Gender Center and on top of that, um, or uh, aside from that as well, in addition to that, uh, that we could have a chief diversity officer as well so that these two entities together could do uh, two things. On the one hand, the director of the Cross-Cultural and Gender Center would focus primarily on everything dealing with the student activities and with the student events that will really promote diversity within our campus and anti-racism specifically. And then on the other hand then, the chief diversity officer would focus on this campus broad, uh, campus wide effort to bring in faculty and also to bring in staff uh, together with the students uh, on these positionalities of anti-racism, diversity, and then also uh, inclusion uh, moving forward as a campus together. Um, so uh, this is going to be uh, implemented in the works uh, pretty soon. We will then have the search for the director of the Cross-Culture and Gender Center, and we will have as well the search for the chief diversity officer 
For the Chief Diversity Officer, we will have a series of forums that will bring people together and that will have the opportunity then to give feedback on what they're looking for for the Chief Diversity Officer because that will be a cabinet level position. Um, and then once you have that position, of course, we will then have that campus broad, campus wide uh, focus and initiative on really promoting who we are as a campus, as an anti-racist campus, but also a side diverse and inclusive campus as well. So thanks for that question. Thank you. And I'm smiling behind the mask, but you can't see. <laughs> <laughs> I know we all are, yes, love it. The great resignation is here and staff resigning, retiring and failed searches due to lack of competitiveness compared to community colleges and private sector who pay more after a long search process. How is our campus preparing for this? It will ultimately impact service to campus. Yeah, I mentioned before that there's a, there's a, there's a study that will be coming out pretty soon on staff salaries. I think that will position us uh, fairly well in terms of salary and in terms of being competitive as well with that. Uh, they are, of course, also uh, uh, plans to do the same thing for faculty moving forward. Um, I think these, the salary is the basic part of it, though. Um, then aside from that, of course, we as a campus during the strategic plan, we have to come up with, with, a, with an answer. We have to come up with, we are right now at a crossroads. Um, uh, one path leads to uh, what we have known you know, throughout as a campus. We come together, we work together, we think together, and we create community together as well. The other pathway, of course, it's the inclusion of telework and uh, the virtual modality. How do we then marry these two in order to then reconcile this fork that we see at the road moving forward will be one of the answers that the strategic plan will determine moving forward. Um, the other part, of course, is the quality, the quality of life that someone has when they come to Fresno State. Uh, I think a lot of times we, we think that, um, that other entities or working for someone else um, is, is just a given. It's just, it's just, the grass is always greener on the other side. Uh, we often uh, tend to think that way. I have come to realize, and this is not just because I am uh, your president, but I have really introspectively thought about this for many years, how it is that, that it is great to work for an institution that number one, transforms the community, transforms the individual to become someone in our community, a leader in the community. And then that one individual then graduates from us. And from that point on, their whole trajectory, their whole life is changed forever and ever. And then they in turn impact their, their immediate family and their immediate communities as well. So, so this, this legacy that we have at Fresno State is not to, it, it is not to be undervalued in any way, shape or form. The other part is that working for Fresno State provides incredible benefits. And oftentimes we think of the benefits as something that has to be added on just because it's there. But let's stop and think about what these benefits mean. Um, if you are a staff member uh, on, you know, uh, at Fresno State, you will get two days of vacation per month. Uh, very few other institutions do that. If you're a staff member or a faculty member at Fresno State, you will get most holidays off as well. Very few other institutions do that as well. And then, of course, Fresno State also takes care of you through health, health uh, care plans and also vision plans and everything else. And you feel good about being at Fresno State. So I do understand that there is what it's called the great resignation at Fresno State. I also understand that we will also lose staff to other institutions during this process and during this great resignation as well. Yet at the same time, I also understand that we will also have other people join our team and we'll also have other people see the value of Fresno State so that we can all collectively move forward in this direction. So I've, I've basically map, mapped out, you know, what I believe uh, uh, is happening. We are working. I'm very much aware that the salaries need to be more competitive. I know that. I know that because I see the difference between our, uh, our university system and other systems in other parts of the country. 
and even within California as well as the question said within the community college system. I am aware of that and we are working towards that. At the same time, I also believe that there is great there's a great sense of satisfaction that comes from working at Fresno State as well. So it's not just a one-piece answer. I think it's a holistic approach to what does it mean to be here and what does it mean for me to contribute not only to the institution, but to the greater community as a whole as well. Thank you. Um, there's a request for an update on the naming of the library task force. Thanks for that question. So as many of you know, um, we were made aware uh, last semester of uh, details within a book that Dr. Uh, uh, Bradley uh, uh, published. Um, and within this book, of course, it stated that um, Henry Mann uh, espoused very strong Nazi uh, inclinations um, uh, within uh, his early life within the 30s and within the 40s as well of his life. Um, he left to us 53 boxes that he himself curated uh, before turning them into the library. Um, these 53 boxes then, uh, when you go through them, and there is a task force that I have charged uh, who is being led right now uh, by Michael Lukens. This task force includes people from the community uh, as well as uh, uh, staff and faculty from the university as well, because this is all; these are all invested individuals in what is happening with the library. Um, they are going through; they're very organized. They're going through the contents of these 53 boxes in order to determine if there is a trajectory or a development of thought that, at the end, leads to someone leads to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Madden saying. I made a mistake, I made a grave mistake, and I, re and I, I basically uh, uh, am going to reject the views that I had as a young man. Um, right now, this, this task force uh, is charged with that. I have been to the archives, I have seen uh, some of the initial documents that are deeply hurtful and, and that are just extremely, extremely deeply uh, disturbing as well at the same time. They're violent, um, and these views, of course, are not ones that, that coalesce with what the library represents. The library is a space in which we come, we commune with each other, we learn, we explore, and we become ourselves as well. Um, so if someone has these uh, views on Nazism, uh, especially after having seen the horrors of the Holocaust after 1945, when these came to light in photographs and in film and in documents and everything else, when someone still espouses these views, and when someone does not reject these views, and when someone still, at the end of the life, curates these documents um, and presents them forward to the library, uh, that is the question that is before our minds. The, the group, the task force, then will have an answer about the content and about the research. The classes, uh, students of classes are invested in, in this. The history department has been a champion in all of this as well. Um, as well as uh, Mila Versibegovic from MCLL. Uh, she's also um, uh, very much involved uh, together um, with professors in history. They are all working together in order to present a thorough and comprehensive analysis of the contents of the 53 boxes, which should come to us towards the end of March. Um, and then at that point, we will have forums for the community uh, to see the same exact documents that we have been uh, that we have been seeing throughout, the same exact contents, the same exact conclusions about uh, what these 53 boxes include, and then at that point, then we collectively will then present uh, the next steps um, uh, moving forward as as a community as well. So I hope that gives you a brief update of the intense work that has been going on uh, for the past uh, months uh, within with this task force. Thank you. And this will probably be the last question. And again, um, obviously, we did not get to everyone's question. There are still 37 in the queue. 
Um, so please know again that the um, president and the cabinet will be receiving all of your questions. Um, my, I, I know that the updated COVID things will be folded in as, as um, W.A. Stone indicated earlier. Um, and so please note that all of that will be happening for those who didn't get addressed this morning. And thank you for your, your passion and your wonderful questions. So over the past few years, you have placed a bold emphasis and focus on athletics and academics, which are critically important. But we would like to hear more about your hopes and vision for student affairs, enrollment management, auxiliary services, and information technology. Great. <laughs> that's a I, uh, that, that's a mouthful of a uh, of a question, minutes, two minutes. right? <laughs> In thirty seconds or less. <laughs> so I'll go with student affairs first. Uh, with student affairs, I presented to you in our last assembly my vision of how it is that student success is based primarily on the efforts of student affairs and academic affairs coming together. Uh, student affairs provides our students with the ability to identify themselves to the space and to each other. What does that mean? It means that at one point in a student's life, in a student's journey at Fresno State, they will say to themselves the following, I belong at Fresno State, but more importantly, Fresno State belongs to me. That is the journey of student affairs. And I have over and over emphasized how it is that the valuable, invaluable, uh, contributions of student affairs are crucial in uh, collaborating in tandem with academic affairs. Academic affairs, of course, like I've said before, is where the student goes to class and at one point in that student's life, they will say to themselves, I want to become her. I want to be like her. I want to be a biologist. I want to be a physicist. I want to be a teacher. I want to be a business person. I want to be like they are. I want to be an artist. So these two together contribute to the success of what, uh, of what the student does at Fresno State. I'm looking forward to the new uh, the Vice President of, of Student Affairs because this person will bring this energy that will then take us into this collaborative spirit just like Dr. Kuhn has done with Dr. Fu throughout and with me when I was provost moving forward. And I want to thank Dr. Kuhn for everything she's done throughout this time to really lead with a vision and with a passion. She always leads with what's best for our students. So that's student affairs. Let's go on to IT. IT right now is poised to get their new CIO and vice president for technology. And she is coming on board. Uh, Bao Jori is going to come from Sacramento. She is a Hmong American woman who is creative, who is completely in tune with what our students, our faculty, and our whole community needs in regards to technology. She is not impersonal. She's just the opposite. She's very much engaged with the individual, and she wants to get to know the issue, the human issue of it, so that we can then have a technological answer for that. So I'm very much excited for that, and I again want to thank Robert Wynn for all of the efforts he has done uh, in leading IT during this process and also being part of that search committee that will bring uh, uh, Vice President Jory uh, to us as well. So that's the other part. Auxiliary then, it's a truly comprehensive, important part of the university. This is really where we can make money. This is really where we can have resources at the university that can then stabilize us and complement the academic, the student affairs side of the house. So within this, I'm very much confident that, you know, as we're going through this pandemic, we will come ahead. The new Kendall bookstore in the in Campus Point, it's an impressive space. You walk, I mean, now you walk, you drive down to that street and immediately you see the big bulldog right there. That's Fresno State branding at its best. And that is, you know, that's what I'm looking for in the future as well. Within this, I have big plans for the farm. I have big plans, for example, for the creamery. We produce incredible ice cream, we produce incredible corn, and we also produce a third incredible product, which is wine. And for the most part, 
we know the wine of Fresno State is good, but it's not, it's not, it's not spoken widely uh, enough. I have very strong plans to really move that ahead. I have sent a, a bottle of wine to every single president within the CSU system, and I've told them the following. Do you like this wine? I'm sure you will because it's gold winning. Great. We can put your label in the front with our label in the back. We will say the label of Maritime, for example, instead of having tailgates, they're going to have sailgates in the front. And then in the back, it says produced by Fresno State. Stanislaus is also coming on board with their own President's Reserve as well. And then other universities have reached out to me and have said, we will also purchase your wine. So this is just an idea to give you. I know that during this, you know, during these times, for the most part, we, we want to take care of the basics and we want to take care of like, what is the most urgent thing, right? But behind the scenes, in my office, in collaboration with the team, with the cabinet, what am I doing? I'm planning for big things. I'm planning for not just asking, you know, for a few thousand dollars to improve our facilities. I'm going for the big millions because we deserve it, because we are the fifth largest city in all of California, and because we have this incredible potential. We have earned our position within this valley and within California as well. So uh, in, within all of this, I hope I answered that question, Betsy. Um, I want to thank all of you for everything that you do, which means the following, for the passion that you put into your position, for the teaching that you provide to our students, for the care that you show to someone, whether it be a colleague or whether it be a student, and for really building together this notion of unity, this notion of Bulldog family that we have at Fresno State. I know these are tough times. I know that because I also feel that, you know, within my own extended family and within my own, my own life. But I also know that together we will do it. And together we will plan that strategic plan moving forward and we will reach that pinnacle that belongs to us and lonely to us. So thanks for all you do. I look forward to speaking to you in the future and say hi if you see me on campus.